With the first Rebirth of Mothra having proven profitable at the Japanese box office, Toho immediately set out to make a sequel. Director Okihiro Yoneda was replaced with the first film's assistant director, Kunio Miyoshi, while most of the team, including special effects director Koichi Kawakita and screenwriter Masumi Suetani, remained. And so Rebirth of Mothra 2 was released only a year after the first, which, while presenting some fresh new ideas, suffers from many of the same issues as its predecessor. When three children happen upon a strange small furry creature, they find themselves drawn into a conflict between the Elias twins Mala Laura and their evil sister Belvira, who is seeking a treasure of a lost underwater civilization called Nirai Kanai, so that she may unleash the monster Dagara to punish mankind for polluting the environment. With Dagara rampaging across Japan, the Elias call upon Mothra Leo to stop him, while they, with the help of their human allies, race to stop Belvira from fulfilling her plans. <laughs> While the first Rebirth of Mothra was a decent start to a franchise, it suffered from an overly simplistic story and cardboard cutout characters, making it a hard sit-through for those outside the younger demographic. And so the sequel was the chance to hopefully build upon the foundations of the first while making improvements in those areas where it fell short. Unfortunately, Rebirth of Mothra 2 fails to do this, and in fact is worse in many areas. The film goes to bigger and grander places, but with little compelling tissue to hold it all together, it all comes across as a big illogical mess that contains a few elements to be enjoyed if you strain hard enough to look. The biggest thing holding Rebirth of Mothra 2 back is the way it doubles its focus on its child characters. This in itself isn't necessarily a negative, but the way the film focuses on kid-friendly antics at the expense of almost any semblance of sanity robs the film of the grandiosity that Mothra deserves. There are virtually no adult characters in the film, and the few that are exist merely as comic relief fodder. With that said, the three children here are more interesting than the brother-sister combo in the prior film, displaying at least some semblance of personality at least at first. But when the adventure gets going, they become blank slate human anchors in a plot that indulges in a little too much random wacky craziness for its own good. That leaves the Elias as the last point of engagement, but they feel oddly sidelined here, mere spectators to the story who exist only to summon Mothra, and that's it. All of this is frustrating, because there are good ideas in Rebirth of Mothra 2. The concept of an ancient undersea civilization rising from the ocean, while certainly not original, provides an interesting enough springboard with which to launch an engaging plot that adds to the Mothra mythos. And there are certain elements, such as the cute little Furby creature Gorgo and the poisonous starfish called Barum, that conceptually could accomplish this. But they are merely presented as is, and none are developed beyond the broad outline needed for the excuse to have Mothra fight another monster. This may be more geared towards kids maybe more than your average kaiju film, but that is no excuse for the kind of haphazard, lazy storytelling on display here. That leaves Mothra, and even her, or should I say he, feels underutilized. First off, turning Mothra male feels like a mistake that robs the character of the femininity that made her so unique amongst Toho's pantheon of monsters. And worse is that it's arbitrary, because the gender swap is never played with within the narrative. That complaint aside, the Mothra Leo design is still awesome, and Aqua Mothra is cool, though its execution leaves a little to be desired. The same can't be said for Dagara, the film's villainous kaiju. With regards to both design and execution, it comes off as incredibly bland, cheap, and uninspiring. There's nothing memorable about him, which makes the fight scenes between him and Mothra more boring than they ought to be. The production of Rebirth of Mothra 2 is about on par with the first one, though it does attempt to push boundaries a bit, with exceedingly mixed results. Practical effects sequences, such as the rising of Nira Kanai from the ocean, are very good, but the use of CGI and green screen is distractingly terrible in certain places, making the film feel cheaper than it ought to. Toshiyuki Watanabe returns to score, and while his work here gets the job done, it isn't nearly as majestic or memorable as the first film, which is very disappointing. The cat 
Rebirth of Mother 2 is a disappointing follow-up to the first film that not only fails to improve on its predecessor's faults, but doubles down on them in ways that make it hard to sit through. There are some compelling ideas, but without any semblance of narrative logic or structure holding it together, it all becomes fluffy nonsense. In a sense, the film is cinematic cotton candy, all sugar and no substance. Kids of a certain age are likely to eat it up, but everyone else will be lost or bored trying to keep up with what is going on. It has its moments, but even diehard Mothra fans may struggle to find some value here. For more reviews and opinions on all things Mothra, subscribe and stay tuned to Up From The Depths.